welcome to this brand new season of Leaders of Tomorrow, the only enabling platform for small businesses. Over the past seven years, we have understood what matters most to you, the entrepreneur. And in our eighth year, we're taking head on two of your most pressing concerns, that of funding and mentoring. I'm Sananda Jayasilan. Tonight, we're bringing you part two of an exclusive panel discussion from Leaders of Tomorrow season eight's mega launch episode. Let me introduce our panelists. First up, Ashish Chauhan, MD and CEO of BSC. Ajay Kela, President and CEO of Vadhwani Foundation. Samina Wazir Ali, Executive Chairperson Sipla. A Velumani, Founder Thairoke and Rupa Kudwa, MD, Omidyar Network India. All of these experts shedding light really on the challenges being faced by small businesses when it comes to funding and repayment. They also spoke in depth about the growth story of family-run businesses and what has helped them sustain in the long run, as well as the role of the government when it comes to developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in the country. Take a listen. I have a reason to believe the pitching is done, not done properly, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, he needs more money for expenditure, not for investment. Okay. I don't think banks motivate people to, to, to spend rather than investing. Okay. But I am of that opinion, funds is not a problem as long as you have got a business model, profitability is there, scaling up is needed, I don't think there is a challenge. <laughs> Uh, this uh, same RBI report released in June this year has shown that uh, NPAs for small businesses have pretty much stayed stable at about 8.5%. Large businesses, on the other hand, have seen uh, their NPAs increasing from 15 to 20%. And this is, we're talking about a two-year timeline from 2016 to 2018. When you're talking to lending institutions, when you're talking to financiers, it's always a concern being expressed saying that the small businesses perhaps are the ones where the most challenges is, uh, challenges are when it comes to repayment. Uh, clearly, the data is proving them wrong. So to everyone on this panel then, uh, where perhaps is this mismatch happening? Uh, and what would you like to sort of tell our viewers through this panel discussion about perhaps some of these concerns and how they can be addressed? If I look at it uh, for the small borrowers, uh, the collaterals are more solid. Hmm. The bigger collaterals are uh, quite often, sure. um, you know, shallow. I think that must be one of the reasons why that percentage is far high. Okay. And honesty must be there more for a small man to become big man. And the big man has already become big man and he probably is not worried about what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have something you want to add? No, that's, that's the reason. But sure. I think it's the, uh, it's the uncertainty with the small guy sure. versus the confidence of a big guy is causing this delta. Okay. And uh, the other part is, of course, what I call skin in the game. Hmm. There is yeah. much larger skin in the game for a small entrepreneur compared to his size. Okay. Yeah. Because his business is large part of his net worth. Sure. So you're saying look at the fine print then when it comes to the set of data. The data also uh, probably hides as much as it reveals. Okay. Uh, and therefore, part of the, the number that you see is also because of the lumpiness. There are a few large accounts which skew the number as far as large borrowers are concerned. All right. Samina, this next question is for you. And I really want to talk about your entrepreneurial journey. And if you can you know, use this question to uh, talk to our viewers about what perhaps has helped you in your journey. I understand that growing up, uh, you didn't really think perhaps that you were going to be joining the family business. You did move to London for a few years where you were working and then you decided to come back and join CIPLA. What was that process like for you? You know, just give us some insights into what perhaps helped you change your mind. How did you learn? What went into that? So I think uh, I went uh, to study in London. I did my master's yeah. and I wanted to get a job uh, and I wanted to get a job by myself. Okay. Uh, and that was my only goal. So that was the starting point. And I always thought it would be better to work outside. Mm -hmm. uh, in outside the real India world. or outside the family no, business? No, just outside the family business in okay. the real world uh, before you come back into an environment that's very sheltered. Okay. Uh, and I worked for about four and a half years outside. You know, very different. It was in finance. It had nothing to do with pharma. Uh, and then I came back to India and then I finally joined uh, CIPLA. Okay. Well, what perhaps then, you know, in your, those, those initial uh, days or maybe years when you joined CIPLA, what helped you learn? So, you know, when I joined CIPLA about nine years ago, we were in the middle of a very large transformation. Yeah. So I just got thrown into the deep end. Yeah. Uh, and we moved from being promoter-run, promoter-managed to saying we are better professionally run, mm -hmm. but we'll be promoter-led. And that was a very, very big uh, transition 
for the promoters who had been and run the company for the last 50 to 60 years. So I think I was, you know, I lead, helped lead the transformation. I always felt that if a professional can do a better job leading an organization, that's our duty to the shareholder to make sure that the best person runs the company. Okay. Uh, and we'll always be promoter-led. Sipla was set up by my grandfather 84 years ago mm -hmm. and a very deep value and ethos of giving back and you know putting health care uh, at the forefront and that was the journey so uh, you know I learned pharma learned everything to do with supply chain uh, manufacturing you get thrown into the deep end and I don't think you have a choice okay uh, Dr. Velamani and Samina this question is for the two of you uh, if you could sort of share one insight or one nugget with entrepreneurs watching this interview to say that this is how we have grown these family, you know, family owned and a company started by you, your family owned business. This is how we've grown. This is how perhaps you have, you know, created your own niche in this very large company. This is how you've grown. This is what has helped you sustain over these many years as a family owned, family run business. What would that be? Right. Let me put it this way. Why did they scale up? Yeah. Number one uh, is uh, if I had remained only locally, my profit multiples would have been four or five. Had I gone just regional, it could have been uh, you know, 10, 15. Mm. To say that I have gone national, it's 25, 30. So that is the value the scaling up can give, sure. number one. Number two, are you counting for profit? Are you working for value? Sure. If you are counting for only profit, probably you can sit in one location, keep doing that. It gives you a lot of money, but it doesn't get you the value. But I keep telling to entrepreneurs, please note, there are only two words. One is security, mm. another is prosperity. There is never a secured prosperity. Please scale up, it will give you prosperity. Great. Samina? I think it's about being value driven okay. uh, and knowing what the end goal is and how do you build towards that. I think it's um, also what's important is uh, scale. Uh, and when you build scale, it's about making sure you're building the right fundamental building blocks. Sure. So the scale that you build is actually sustainable profit. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you know, you can show one, two great quarters, but how mm -hmm. do you build for the long term? How do you build for the next generation? I think we've always focused on that. Uh, this next question is for the rest of the panel, but uh, maybe I can come to the two of you first. Uh, and I'm referencing a Harvard Business Review report which came out uh, about a year or two ago where they're talking about family-owned and run businesses in emerging countries, particularly like Brazil and India. Uh, they said that founder-owned and founder-CEO companies are perhaps the worst managed on an average. Barring, of course, the companies that are sitting on this panel, why do you think that is? What is really going wrong? What is your advice? for family-owned, family-run businesses about perhaps how they should be looking and doing things differently? Right. The creator yeah. should run it for some time yeah. till it reaches a scale. Then he becomes old. He should not be thinking that his son or daughter only will be the next in, the, in command. Sure. So he must look at democratization and sure. handing over to some professional body. Sure. Unfortunately, there is too much of love on the children. They do, they in fact sacrifice the company instead of giving them a couple of hundreds of crores. Mm. So I am of that opinion. First 20 years, the promoter should own and run. Next 20 years, promoter should only own, should not run. Next, it can be the family owned and the professional running. Okay, so if professional running, you're saying, okay. It is a huge risk. Okay. So just by example, I already yeah. mentioned it that, you know, we're professionally run. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to have a board yeah. uh, and to have the right governance. Mm -hmm. I think in today's environment, when you have promoters and professionals, creating the right governance around that model is very, very important. So I okay. think companies sometimes slip on their governance models. Okay. What perhaps a lot of uh, entrepreneurs tell us is that it's difficult for them to let go. For promoter-founded companies, it's very difficult to let go. In that scenario, while it is definitely critical, as is being pointed out, what should founders perhaps put in place when they're preparing for that transition? Any advice that you would have? You know, you know, the skill sets that are required to create something and a skill set that is required to scale typically are very different. Mm. Uh, and uh, culturally, so if you look, go into Silicon Valley now, there is typically the handover happens much sooner. Founders are very aware, they, they see around sure. them. They are, they are good at sowing the seeds and taking it to one stage and they start to recognize that scaling is not my business because scaling typically involves a lot of uh, uh, manage opera operations and large scales operation, which is, takes you away from the creativity typically that comes from the early stage. Mm. 
Um, I think in emerging economies, it's been, the culture has been around keeping it in the family. And probably as a result of which, probably you're not re realizing the full value of the company in general. Not, okay. Not, uh, there are, of course, there are exceptions, exceptions. as well. Yeah. Sure, sure. I think if you, if you get yourself a good investor uh, base and if you get yourself a good board, as Amina said, I mm -hmm. think they are good starting points to push for a healthy transition. Okay. So I look at the other way around that I don't believe that the promoter led, promoter owned companies are a bad in corporate governance, the other way around. Okay. In a sense that if you bring in a professional, there is an agency conflict. The professional usually doesn't have a skin in the game. So how do you get him or her to become sort of owner in mindset, which is very difficult. Well, as a promoter owned, promoter driven companies, mm. uh, the promoter's largest amount of net worth, especially at a young company level, is with the company. Mm. Most of his funds are stuck there. And so they actually do it much better. The agency conflict is very little. Mm. And that's where uh, they take care of each pipe as a uh, going forward. And that's where the great companies are built by people, uh, their hard work, and usually not by professionals, especially in a country where the contract execution takes long, long time. And that's where uh, most of the family-run uh, businesses, the contract is informal within the family and that's how it works. Sure. Only when they uh, reach that scale, that's where uh, the professionalism comes in and then uh, the professional uh, sort of framework needs to be set up. Mm. But up to a point in uh, sort of time for a particular company, I would say the agency conflict, if you don't resolve, uh, you have a serious issue with the third parties coming and trying to manage and how U.S. system has resolved it. Uh, the way I look at it is the U.S. system has resolved it by giving huge stock options, by giving huge salaries to the CEOs, which in fact in India, the corporate governance people actually oppose. Sure. Saying that the professional should not get too much money. Uh, while if the professional who is running the company on his or her own, getting that value for mm. the shareholders mm. and shareholders don't want to pay him or her, mm. you are creating basically the seeds. You are okay. sowing the seeds for agency conflict there. Okay. And for me, that's where if you don't compensate well and mm. if he's adding or her, she's adding huge value, they also should be compensated hugely. Sure. Not saying, oh, no, but nokar ko paisa nahi dena chahiye. Mm. So that is where I think our own mindset as a society has to kind of come into play. Time to take a quick break on that note. We'll continue bringing you that panel discussion on the other side. Just stay tuned. Welcome back here with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow tonight, bringing you highlights of an exclusive panel discussion that we did with some of the biggest experts in the country talking about the opportunities and challenges for small businesses. Listen. Uh, two things that I definitely want to touch upon as we're running out of time on this panel and one is the role of the government when it comes to the life of an entrepreneur. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs say government shouldn't get involved at all, hands-off approach. Some are of the opinion that you should have you know, a regulatory framework as well uh, at least and uh, some more are of the opinion that you should definitely have rules that entrepreneurs are abiding by. For innovation to flourish, you know, what perhaps are there uh, are the opinions on this panel in terms of what should be the role of the government when it comes to developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem? This is open to everyone. Sure. Yeah, it's a very sure. vague one. The government doesn't really support expect, except that they keep telling in every forum we want to create entrepreneurs. Having said that, innovation comes from an individual's okay. own experience, looking at the gaps, unmet needs, his own struggle or his people nearby struggle. So innovations are happening. I have a reason to believe government has to help them to um, scale up when there is a need. If funds are a challenge, government should look at how to create an ecosystem where funding is possible. Sure. They need not give the funds. Sure. Okay. 
The government is a powerful entity, right? Mm. First is the just the power of drawing policies. Mm. So draw policies that are supportive of an entrepreneur. Mm. So they need to really play the role of uh, of being the cheerleaders mm. uh, and contributing through through building ecosystems. Uh, introducing policies that are friendly, introducing, they also have deep, deep pockets. So they can create the ecosystems around, around you know, loans. Sure. They can create ecosystems around what SIDBI, what government did through SIDBI now, or funds of funds that they have created. Uh, sure. Those are enabling uh, ecosystems. So the government the has an enabler role in your opinion? Yeah. Sure. But the government, for me, many of us take government as one single uh, omnipresent actor. Entity yeah. who has mind of its own, mm. but government is at various levels. Mm. Uh, there is no one single entity in a way. You have a municipality which has its own regulation, like shops and establishment act. Uh, you also have uh, the state governments, and then you have central governments, which have various departments, including the environmental uh, regulatory department, vis a vis uh, sort of a provident fund regulations, and so on. And so all of mm. them, you take them as one single entity which troubles you as sure. an entrepreneur. But effectively, if you understand each of them, their functions, mm. and work to ensure that it's a compliance function, what the society wants, what the government uh, kind of does is that it makes you comply with the societal norms. Sure. Uh, and that's where, if you understand that, it becomes easier for you to kind of comply with these norms. In addition, the governments, uh, whoever thinks they are government, also have a role to develop uh, newer ecosystems, newer ways to do things so that the society mm. uh, continues to thrive and also ends up paying more taxes so that uh, the government mm. runs on taxes. So that's where uh, they would continue to develop uh, more and more entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. That is a hope sure. on which uh, the governments want to do it. But overall, we take governments as people who put hurdles in your place mm. and so on and so forth, which is not true. Mm. It is the other way around that we do not understand as entrepreneurs what is required to comply. And once we understand actually comply, uh, then uh, it becomes easier okay. to uh, do things. But if you don't want to comply and then keep on blaming governments, then... So that's also an enabler's role, essentially. Right. Is of, uh, okay. Also, basically, also a little bit of training of entrepreneurs. Saying, uh, if you are dealing in this business, these are the 55 things uh, you are expected to comply with. Uh, and that's where it will basically reduce that mistrust sure. or distrust that happens in entrepreneurs' lives. Saying, but I'm doing so much and people are not helping me. In fact, they are trying to hurt me. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Okay. It's just that you are not aware of the compliances uh, that is required and you must comply because uh, compliance is a costly affair, right? Sure. But non-compliance is disastrous, right? Sure. So we must learn to comply. Okay. One big area where the government can play a huge role as far as helping entrepreneurs and small businesses is concerned is the whole area of skill development. So how do you really be, play an enabling role to create a skilling ecosystem is one thing I would highlight. I think the government, we cannot get away from the government playing an yeah. important role there. The second role, particularly as India is rapidly being transformed by technology, the government has an important role to play in creating digital infrastructure. So whether it be things like your digital identity at one end, mm. or it could be things like the account, new account aggregator that the RBI has now announced. Yeah. I think these are very, very important elements that entrepreneurs can use to build off, build businesses off. Sure. And I think the government has a big role to play. Sure. There. Very briefly then, closing comments as we've run completely out of time. Um, and this is a masterclass for our entrepreneurs as we kick starting season eight of the Leaders of Tomorrow. And I want to come to my immediate right uh, if there is one thing that you want to leave our entrepreneurs with, what would it be? Yeah, there is a saying for every successful man, there is a lady behind. <laughs> I wish to hear in another 10 years, for every successful lady, there is a man behind. Sure. This is my wish. And I think it's just, you know, be risk averse. Just mm -hmm. go out and get it. If you dream it, you can actually do sure. it. Sure. Everyone should try to become an entrepreneur. The upside mm -hmm. is there. Uh, well, as if you remain... Uh, an employee, you don't get the upside, okay. uh, of course, unless you get stock options. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, an inter entrepreneur's life is very risky, very exciting, and gets you upside. Even okay. if you fail, you will be a greater employee, a better employee, mm. uh, if you had been an entrepreneur before. Sure. These are we have employee who has never been an entrepreneur. So for sure. me, I look at people 
who have at least tried to be entrepreneurs and they seem to be the best <laughs> employees even uh, even if they have failed before. Okay. So, uh, we have 10 seconds, we are running out oh, uh, sure. on time, but go ahead, Ajay. So, uh, I am going to borrow <laughs> Dhirubhai Ambani's uh, Suno Sapke Karo Apni. Okay. Uh, and it's a free advice that is available to you. Go talk to as many people sure. because you're going to learn so much and then you can decide and apply it sure. to your own business. Okay, I'll let you have the I last one. I would say India's time is now. Okay. Never before has the ecosystem for entrepreneurship been as good as it today. So if you have any thoughts of taking the plunge, take it now. Fantastic. On that very optimistic note, I want to thank each of you for making the time to be with us here tonight. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Completely out of time on this show. If you have any feedback for us, our contact details are coming up. We love hearing from you. So do continue sending in your comments, your feedback and your thoughts. Thanks so much for watching.